Good evening, and welcome to Horrific History, where I bring you the creepiest real-life stories from the darkest recesses of our history. For a continual supply of creepiness, hit that subscribe button and the bell icon so you never miss a future episode. Sit back, hit the lights, and let's begin. You may not have heard of Herman Webster Mudgett. How about Alexander Bond? No? Henry Gordon? What if I tell you that these people are all the same person? Born in Gilmington, New Hampshire on May 16, 1861, Herman started life as any normal child, in the middle of five children with a devout Methodist upbringing. Mudgett graduated high school at 16 and had a few teaching jobs around the local area. Herman enrolled in the University of Vermont when he was 18. However, he was not happy with the school and changed to the University of Michigan, Department of Medicine and Surgery, a year later, and graduated in June of 1884. His time in college is where his crimes are thought to have begun. He admitted to using cadavers to defraud life insurances during trials later in his life, which we'll get to eventually. In 1878, he was wed to Clara Lovering and together they had a son in 1880. This was not to last, as Mujit was often cited as acting violently towards Clara, and she returned to New Hampshire in 1884, and didn't hear from him again. During the time between 1884 and 1886, Mujit moved around from New York to Pennsylvania, and ending up in Chicago in 1886. During this time, he remarried twice each time still being wed to his previous wives and only filing for divorce from his first wife. August of 1886 sees Mudgett arrive in Chicago under a new alias. He got a job at Elizabeth S. Holton's drugstore and was a dedicated and hardworking employee, eventually buying the store. And later, he bought the vacant lot across the street and in 1887, construction of a mixed-use building began, consisting of apartments on the second floor with retail spaces, including a new drugstore, on the ground floor. In 1892, he added a third floor for a hotel, although it was largely incomplete. During this time, Mudgett was known to the community as Henry Howard Holmes, which is the name you are likely familiar with. Suppliers for homes discovered that he was hiding materials in hidden passages and rooms throughout the building, materials he never paid for. Some of the rooms were soundproof within a maze of hallways and dead ends. Many of the rooms had chutes, similar to laundry chutes, that would go all the way to the basement, a basement that contained quick line, acid vats, and a crematorium. The furniture supplier's discoveries made it to the newspapers, causing investors of the hotel section to withdraw. While that description sounds rather mundane, bear in mind that this murder castle spanned for a full block and contained well over a hundred rooms. How Holmes managed to do this without anyone catching on to this scheme is he used multiple builders and architects throughout construction, many of whom he refused to pay. The investigation into Holmes began in 1894 and police were thoroughly confused by what they found. On top of what the suppliers had already found, the police found walls that could be moved, chambers beneath floorboards, and an intricate alarm system that would alert homes to anyone opening doors or descending the stairs to the basement. All of this by itself, although bizarre, was not really cause for an alarm. However, the police did also find a pile of bones. This pile of bones contained mostly animal bones, but it also contained human bones. More specifically, the bones of children. Descending into the basement was a total shock for the police, and I must warn you, this next part will be rather graphic. In the basement, the police found acid vats, the crematorium, and the lime. On top of this, they also found an operating table covered in blood, blood-soaked clothes of an unknown woman, torture devices, as well as medical tools. Holmes would use the chutes to drop bodies into the basement, where he would dissect his victims, clean their bones, and sell the organs and the entire skeleton to medical institutes or universities, or just simply sell them on the black market. In 
It can be said that Holmes' earliest victim was a young boy who vanished after being seen with Holmes while he lived in New York, or another young customer from the pharmacy in Philadelphia dying after Holmes provided pills to them. Holmes denied these claims, but he did leave town suspiciously after both incidents. Being quite a charming man, it comes as no surprise that Holmes had a mistress in addition to his three wives. Julia Smythe was the wife of Ned Connor and worked at the pharmacy counter in Holmes Pharmacy. She went missing on December 24th, 1892, with Holmes claiming she died from a botched abortion. However, that didn't explain the disappearance of Julia's daughter, Pearl, at the same time. Yet another mistress, Emmeline Sigrand, worked in the building from May 1892 until her disappearance in December of that same year. Edna Van Tassel is also thought to have been a victim of Holmes' twisted ways. In 1893, a one-time actress named Minnie Williams came to Chicago, where Holmes offered her a job of being his personal stenographer, which she accepted. Holmes persuaded Minnie to transfer her property to a man named Alexander Bond, who, you'll remember, is an alias of Holmes. And in April of that year, she did just that. Holmes and Minnie rented an apartment in Chicago's Lincoln Park, where Minnie's sister, Nanny, would come to visit, letting her aunt know that she planned to join her brother Harry on a trip to Europe. Minnie and Nanny went missing in July of 1893. After a brief time in jail for minor crimes in 1894, Holmes murdered longtime friend and accomplice Benjamin Peitzel after he agreed to fake his own death in an insurance scam. Holmes burnt Peitzel alive and collected the $10,000 life insurance payout while also taking custody of three of Peitzel's children. He took the children through northern United States and into Canada while also escorting Mrs. Peitzel along a parallel route with the two groups sometimes being within mere blocks of each other along with his own wife, who had no idea about the whole scheme. Holmes confessed to murdering two of the children, Alice and Nellie, by asphyxiation and burying them in a cellar of a rental house in Toronto. This was confirmed by Frank Gayer, a detective assigned to investigate Holmes, who wrote, The deeper we dug, the more horrible the odour became. And when we reached the depths of three feet, we discovered what appeared to be the forearm of a human being. Gaya later found the body of Howard Pietzel, Benjamin's son, in the chimney of a house Holmes rented in Indianapolis. November 17, 1894 is the day Holmes' atrocities came to an end. When he was arrested in Boston after the Pinkertons, a private detection agency widely known throughout the USA, tracked him there from Philadelphia. He was held on a warrant for horse theft in Texas. But police became more suspicious of him, as Holmes seemed ready to flee the country in the company of his unsuspecting third wife. Once the bodies of Alice and Nellie were found in July of 1895, the Chicago police and reporters began to call Holmes' building in Englewood the castle, or the murder castle. In October of 1895, Holmes was put on trial for the murder of Benjamin Pietzel and later sentenced to death by gallows. After his conviction, Holmes confessed to a further 27 murders in Indianapolis, Toronto, and Chicago, as well as six attempted murders. This confession has since been proven to be false, as it was paid for by the Hearst newspaper for a sum of $7,500, which is about $230,000 when adjusted for inflation. And many of the victims were still very much alive, much of Holmes' life cannot be known for certain, as he had a propensity for lying to the point where he claimed he was possessed by Satan and blamed his gaunt lunk while imprisoned as a result of this. Holmes was hanged on May 7, 1896, at Moyamasing Prison in Philadelphia for the murder of Pietzel. Holmes remained calm up to the point of his death, showing no signs of fear or anxiety. In an amusing twist of fate, Holmes requested that his coffin be buried at least 10 feet deep and surrounded by cement to prevent grave robbers from stealing his corpse and selling parts of his body. Holmes' death was not as quick and painless as a hanging should be, as his neck did not break when the trapdoor opened. Instead, he was strangled, continuing to twitch for 15 minutes after, being pronounced dead 20 minutes after the door had opened.
I hope you enjoyed this first episode of Horrific Histories. If you'd like to see more of them, please let me know in the comments below. Thank you for watching and let me know your thoughts. Don't forget to leave a like if you enjoyed this video. You can follow me on most social medias and you can chat with me over at the Opinionated Outcast Discord server. All links are in the description below. If you really enjoy what I do, consider supporting me on Patreon for as little as $2 a month where there are rewards, sneak peeks and other Patreon only exclusives. Thank you. And remember, it's always scarier when it's real. Good night.